Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Kensington. I'm so happy you all are here with us today. Um, would you all stand as we worship together?
Great way to start off the morning. Go ahead and take a seat, everybody. It's great to be reminded who the King of Kings is as we begin this day and we begin this week. My name is Ryan Morrill. I'm part of our staff family here. And uh, I, if you know anything about what I do around here, I focus a lot on what's happening with families. And the month of August, there is so much going on with families that I'm excited to share with you about. First one is actually taking place this Wednesday, which it's August 3rd. Is anybody else sad or freaking out that tomorrow is August 1st? If you're a teacher like my wife is, we say that uh, August is the Sunday of summer, right? So it's coming to an end, which is sad. But we're excited because Wednesday, August 3rd is our midweek, our normal date uh, for all midweeks. And this one's going to be special. We have Spring Hill Day Camps that are here this week. We'll have hundreds of kids running throughout this building uh, all week long, and we're excited about that. But on that night, starting at 6 p.m., we're going to open this uh, building up and the Spring Hill experience up in many ways for families. You see, a, there's, a, I think, a rock and climbing wall out there in the parking lot now. We'll have some bungee trampolines, hopefully some slides going, lots of games uh, where families can come and experience this for, uh, from 6 to 7. We're going to have dinner in the lobby as well. It's a free dinner, so make sure you come out to experience that. And then beginning at 7 o'clock, everybody's going to come into the service here. All families sit together, little ones. We have child care for them, birth through 5 years old. But we'll have worship, just fun, upbeat worship. We'll have some fun up here on stage as well with, with a game most likely. And then we're going to dismiss our elementary kids out of the room for a time just for them. And then we're going to talk just openly, authentically, honestly as parents uh, with you, with each other. We're going to be blessed to have Craig uh, along with his wife Nicole up here, Sam Anderson and his wife Amber are going to be here, as well as Jeremiah, if you know Jeremiah from the Clarkston campus and his wife Maria, along with several of their teenagers that are going to be here as well. And so we're going to have a chance just to talk about the successes, the challenges, the pitfalls that have happened. And again, I use the word authentic. It's going to be a very authentic conversation because if you're a parent in this room, especially as they're getting older, it is like a minefield trying to navigate uh, this landscape, especially right now in the world with everything going on. And so we look forward to sharing this time with you. So come on out. You don't need to register. We just hope you show up and enjoy that experience with us. It's going to be great. Another thing we're excited about for families is three weeks from now, Sunday, August 21st, we're not going to be in this building together, all right? We're not going to be here, so please make a mental note of that. We are going to be several miles away from here at Wildwood Amphitheater on Sunday morning, August 21st. The service actually starts. We're asking everybody to get there at 1030. It's going to be an outdoor experience. We as a staff went over and just kind of checked out and the lay of the land this week, got a picture of the way it was all going to roll and the fun that's going to be had. We'll have lots of games. We're going to have food that takes place after the service too, so we'll serve a free lunch as well. Um, and then we'll have a great service uh, that engages the whole family on stage as well. And we're celebrating baptisms that morning. So wonderful opportunity, especially if you want to get baptized, you can go to kensingtonchurch.org slash baptism to sign up for that. So please, please, please uh, make sure you're remembering August 21st to come and experience that day with us. Uh, final thing I want to share as I'm talking about families is um, something that's going on uh, on an app that we're excited to release. I was actually doing some research this last week. And I found out that the average adult spends quite a few hours a day on their phone. Does anybody want to take a guess? What's the number of hours you think an adult spends on his or her phone? Four, six, seven. I'm hearing younger voices say seven, right? Believe it or not, the average number is 5.4 hours a day on your phone. Now, for some of you, that number might seem a little high. Others of you, maybe it seems a little bit low. But that's the average. Now, 5.4 hours. You want to do some multiplication. If you average that 5.4 hours out over the course of an entire year, that means you are on your phone for 82 straight days. 82 days, 24 hours straight, you are spent looking at a screen. It's basically an entire season, right? An entire season. Imagine June 21st saying, gosh, to the middle of September, I'm just going to look at my phone the entire time. Right Now, if you want to average this out too, especially as I'm talking about parents and families, if you have a child, you know, a child gets birth, and you go all the way to 18 years, right? In that 18 years, you as a parent will spend four years looking at your phone. Four years of those 18 years looking at your phone. Now, I'm not up here to talk to you about your screen time usage, but if you're going to look at your phone, I hope you do, or I hope you look at something that is beneficial during that time. And that's why I'm here to talk to you about a new app. It's called
called the Parent Q app. Actually, it's not that new, but it's something that we are embracing here at Kensington. The company that we use all of our children's curriculum from, all of our videos, all of our teaching, everything that's happening in our kids' area comes from this company, Orange. And they have an incredible app called the Parent Q app. In fact, um, I was able to screen record just a little bit of the usage of it this, this last week. And on this app, there's my phone. By the way, notice the 4,587 unopened emails, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting story, but we're not here to talk about that today. So here it is. You open the app. You get to enter your child in there. There's a picture of my son, Parker. We were out at the golf course taking advantage of the time we have. It lists there 472, 417 weeks until he moves on to what is next. You have 936 weeks with your child from birth to the age of 18. I'm basically, I'm halfway through my time with this kid. It helped me frame how I spend my time. And that's what's beautiful about this app is it helps us think about it. Now, you can open up the app and it begins to give you all sorts of resources right here. It shows the actual teaching that's taking place in Kensington Kids this Sunday morning. So if you miss church, you can open up the app and boom, there is the exact lesson, the lesson that we might teach live from us, but they also have it recorded on video. It also has incredible resources for parents and parent guides. I get tons of questions about devotionals. What can I show my kids? The devotional that's in sync with what we're doing on Sunday mornings is listed right there as well. And finally, parents are always wondering, how do I engage in conversation with my kids about spiritual issues? Well, guess what? They give you great prompts in the morning when kids wake up, in the car, dinner time or meal time, and bedtime as well. They give you these things, tons of activities, and there's also a store. It is like Barnes & Noble if you go to the Orange Store on everything you could ever imagine for raising kids in this world, from mental health issues to discipleship. The other thing you can do is you can cater the app to exactly what's going on at our church. So if you open the app and you hit the church icon, it shows everything that's going on in our kids' area at the Orion campus. You have to pick our church. Once you sign up for the app, it's easy to find and it'll prompt you through all that. But there it is, we list our events, the things I just talked about, Spring Hill Camps, August 3rd midweek coming up. And there it is, August 21st. And there'll be links in there and things if you wanna sign up and register and come to these things because what we love is to get together not only in this building, but outside of this place, outside of Sundays because it allows that connection and relationships drive so much of people loving and wanting to be part of a church and growing together. So we want you to be in life with us. So please, please download this app, Parent Q, that's C-U-E, if you are an elementary or early childhood parent, uh, all the way up through fifth grade, we want you to join in this. We're gonna be talking about this several times throughout the year, and it's a, it's a really incredible opportunity. I wanna bring Craig up right now, um, and uh, we're gonna talk about something else, right? So really yeah. quickly, you had 4,000 unread emails? 4,000, yes, sir. So my competitive side wants you to know that I have 41,000 unread emails. 41,000. If you look at my phone, it's 41,000. I have 10% so. of yours. So you <laughs> must get so many emails, Craig. Oh my goodness. So. Um, all right, so hard turn yeah, for a minute. Turn. Um, I'm actually coming back up. We've, we're gonna dive into this series in just a couple minutes. But we, we had a change this morning. I wanted to come up a little bit sooner because we wanna have a really brief family moment. Uh, because one of our own here from the Orient campus was in a pretty bad accident this weekend. Uh, his name is Roland. Uh, his wife is Tracy. Uh, I'm going to let Ryan, who knows him very well, their personal friends, can tell you a little bit more yeah. about it. And then uh, just because we love Roland and we're concerned for him and his recovery and what you're going to hear happen, we're going to pray for him together yeah. as a community as well. Yeah, Roland Pascu, if you know him, um, he is an incredible just advocate for so many things going on from Hope Water to a current thing that he's uh, just giving literally his physical life for, which is Make-A-Wish Foundation. He's bike he was biking across the entire state of Michigan raising money mm -hmm. for this Make-A-Wish, and it's a three-day event. And yesterday, um, he was biking somewhere in the middle of the state, and a car coming the other way jumped out and came across the lane and struck him as well as several other bikers. Um, and uh, Roland uh, is alive. He is surviving. He's in critical condition, and wh that's why we're going to pray for him with some very severe injuries. Uh, two of the riders that were struck uh, did not survive, and so it is a heartbreaking situation for so many people that are close to Kensington, so many people that love Roland, and Roland, these were his biking team. These were guys that he had trained with um, and had spent so many hours with of his life. Um, and so uh, we want to pray for him, like, like Craig said, pray for his wife, Tracy, who uh, 
there in Lansing right now at a hospital there. He has two teenage children that go to school in Rochester Hills, and he was one of our children's volunteers for many years when his kids were younger. His children have grown up in this church, and so uh, we want to lift him up today. Yeah, Roland and Tracy are a staple part of this community, but even the two riders that lost their lives, are they're all a part of a group of riders, many of which are here at Kensington. I, I talked to about a half a dozen people that know all of them, including the two that lost their lives yesterday that were here this morning. So uh, a lot of people impacted by this, but as Roland is fighting just for recovery right now, uh, we just wanna pray for him. So here's what I'd love to invite you to do. If prayer is any part of your life, then you might know this already. There's just a precedent in the Bible at times of putting your hands on people as a way to just say, we wanna be the hands of God, and it's kind of a, a request almost to beckon God to move as you reach out and touch. And so here's what I'd love to invite you to do. If we were in the hospital room with Roland, I'd have us surround the bed and we'd all put our hands on him. Obviously, we're not there. He's not here. So could you just extend your hand if you're gonna pray this morning? Let me pray. And you just extend your hand as a way to just agree with us in this prayer and say if he was here, we'd put our hands on him. So Father, we just come before you right now in the name of Jesus Christ, the matchless, the immeasurable, the above all other names name. And we ask that you who are the one who created Roland, it was your intention and design your hands that we believe even before he was in the womb knew him and formed him and so God his whole life is yours and so I pray that the hands that made him the mind that dreamed him up I pray would be the power right now that heals him would be the power that comes over him and his family I pray God that what is broken would be mended what has been hurt would be restored I pray that through all of the efforts of the medical teams around him and even, God, through the supernatural work of you breathing into their efforts, of you expediting his healing, God, would you do what only you can do? And would you bring a fullness and a healing to him? There is a long road ahead of him for the recovery that he has. God, we pray that he will have a day very soon that he is out of this bed, that he begins his recovery process. God, I pray for Tracy, for the kids, that you would overwhelm them with a very real sense of your presence, of your hope, of your care for Roland, of your intervention into this situation to bring healing to his body. I pray that we as a community would be consciously aware of him, that we would lay him before you in prayer, and that we would also be attentive to see how it is that we can serve Tracy, serve him, come around the family in tangible, expressive ways to say we love you and you are a part of a body bigger than even just yourself. And so God, we pray that you would heal him. We pray that you would bring him back to fullness. We pray that you would comfort the family along the way in the process. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thanks, Mike. So this morning, we're gonna start off in a new series that we are launching this week. For the next couple of weeks, we are in a series that we are calling Boomer XYZ. It's a series looking at the different generations that exist under the sun right now. And I think you can make a very easy argument that although all generations under any moment of history have struggled to fully understand each other, because of technology, because of just differences of values, there's an easy argument. We, we don't always get the other generations, whether they're younger than us or older than us, but I think you could easily argue that right now is possibly the largest gap of understanding that has ever existed between generations. With the advancement of technology, with the development of a lot of different uh, ways that we do life compared to even just 10 or 15 or 25 years ago to evolving and changing sense of values and right and wrong and morality and the fluidity of life right now, there is a possibly a broader gap that has ever existed in our attempt to understand one another. But if the body of Christ is to be a linked arms community of diversity across every channel of what could divide, then I think it's critical that we spend a couple of weeks understanding how do we better value appreciate and love one another that we can more effectively lock arms. So one of the things we're gonna do for the next couple of weeks, we're gonna introduce you right now to a short video of a group of people that represent four different generations and just sharing together in an open, honest conversation about some of the uniquenesses of how they view life, how they view one another, and what it looks like to link and lock arms better. So here, check this out.
I'm Generation X, Gen X, I think is what they call us. <laughs> um, I, I think we're very strong. I think we have a really good work ethic. We value family, value relationships, like that personal connection. Some of our weaknesses, um, we're very set in our ways. We like things done in an orderly fashion, and I think we sometimes don't like change, or it's difficult to embrace change when we are used to things going a certain way. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm a baby boomer. I think our generation is a lot like your generation. Mm -hmm. and, um, although I think we're very strong from a patriotic standpoint, I think we uh, uh, that would be a big thing with us. We're very hardworking. <clears throat> We were, I think, the last generation that really wanted to stay at one place for a long time from an employment standpoint. Yeah. And um, of course, that's really changed. But uh. So I'm a millennial. Um, strengths, I think we are a very uh, flexible generation. We fly by the seat of our pants. We want an adventure out of life. We've uh, grown up in a way where we expect more out of life, which mm -hmm. lends itself to you know things like justice, things like taking new ground. And on the flip side of that, it has left, um, which the boomers love to tell me, uh, has left our generation in a very entitled position. Uh, so we expect a lot of, out of life, um, but are struggling maybe to catch up at, on how to actually get it. Do you agree with the boomer generation saying that there's a sense of entitlement with your totally. generation? Yeah, okay. definitely there is. And I think that's really probably one of the biggest pain points in between each of the generations is, they feel certain things, they have a, a way that they, they expect life to be, but the why behind it is different for each generation, and that Definitely. is what each generation craves to be uh, understood in. Yeah. I think that's interesting, and I think it's also key, because part of the problem or the disconnect is the understanding of each of the generations and the why that you just mentioned. Um, and I think that only comes with relationships because then you have the opportunity to have those conversations and understand why I believe like I do or why you believe like you do or why you handle things a certain way yeah. versus how Elizabeth would handle certain totally. things. So, yeah. Do you think your generations live in more of a black and white yes or no perspective? Because I feel like like our generations tend to view things through like more of a gray, gray. scale mm -hmm. when it comes to any type of idea and belief and even when it comes to you know the bible and what what jesus says and what following jesus looks like whereas Amen. maybe yeah. for you guys <laughs> maybe for you guys um does that feel like your generation believes like in more of a yes or no this is how it is this is how it isn't mentality we do come from a yes, no, black or white perspective, but we're learning to, uh, to, to be more open to things and really appreciate the strides that have been made with the diversity and inclusion and other things. However, we wrestle with the biblical standard for things. And um, you know, we're called to love everyone. I don't know that that means we just throw out the book and say, hey, we're gonna rip these pages out because they, they don't fit with my new belief system. Yeah. But um, how do we model Christ in these challenging environments? Yeah. You said we're learning. Um, and I, I, to fall on our sword, the millennials, Gen Zers, have not been gracious in that. When a boomer, a Gen Xer, or anyone for that matter, has held maybe a short-sighted view in our eyes, they've been attacked instead of embraced. And there's this division where we could be uh, equally as uh, a criminal of being dogmatic and black and white in the middle of our more thoughtful areas as maybe many of us would like to think about it. I was taught the yes and no black and white, but I even still questioned it, you know, and, you know, going back to what is the Holy Spirit telling me that I need to do in that situation with what the word says, um, and then moving, trying to move in love. And, you know, you'd, you'd fall short, no one's perfect, but I think that's where we have to start and that's the important part, so. We all are craving uh, this sense of more injustice, but the platforms many of us engage with it on are so uh, fraudulent. Yeah. Um, and we are all becoming very used to that and exchanging it for the real version of relationship and the real version of love and the real version of 
experiencing the tension when we have this conversation right now. Yeah. Everything you're saying, we want that. Yeah, yeah. We want, yeah. right? We want folks yeah. to understand us and why we mm-hmm. think the way we do and why we yeah. do the things we do. And I don't think that we think we're right. Yeah. Our, I mean, no, that, right. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, we want to be understood as well. Yeah. We also want to feel valued. Um, in our old-timey ways, <laughs> in our set ways, um, and we still want to feel like we're relevant. Hearing you guys talk, I was really humbled, um, embarrassed, and convicted that we've really thrown away your generation as, uh, uh, you know, and it was very vulnerable of you to share that we want to be wanted and feel relevant and important in your lives. I haven't heard that very often from your generation, and it made me realize, wow, that's very honest of you and also made me feel really sad. I'm like, man, isn't that just like us? We burn things hot and fast and throw it away and on to the next one. And we like take you guys for all we can get. And then we demonize you for the things we don't like. And um, that's sad. So I wanted to say, you know, public apology from the millennials and Gen Zers. <laughs> we love you guys. We need you guys. Weeks. Whoop, there I am. The next couple of weeks, we're going to get to listen to more of that conversation. It's uh, a couple hours long, I believe, when it actually took place, and so we're going to get little snippets of it and continue to be able to peek in. I did learn uh, something new watching that video, though, that uh, as a Gen Xer, apparently my ways are old-timey ways already, so not loving that idea. Um, wanted to tell you, I literally, just before I walked up, my, my watch buzzed, and I looked down, and I got a message that... Roland is actually awake, and he is in a condition where he's able to even write down questions right now. He has a super long road ahead of him, but that's, that's an incredible, incredible. So, all right, I want to pray this morning. We've got a lot of work to do in a very short amount of time to do it, and I want to get to my favorite part of the day, which is I'm going to bring up one of my favorite Gen Zers on stage, and we're just going to have a conversation about him and life and how he sees the world and the church and faith and uh, I think if it's anything like first service, it'll probably be the best part of the morning. So let me get through what I need to quickly to get us to that point. And uh, let me just pray before I do, because we need to hear from Jesus this morning, not me. Lord, I just come before you and acknowledge that you are everything that this book ascribes about you and that Jesus told us about and modeled to us. You are the beginning of all things, the present in all things. You are the after of all things. You are, you are everything. You are the creator, and yet you are the intimate God that wants to know us personally. You are the one who established everything to be beautiful and perfect, and though we broke it, you are the one who works to redeem us. You are the one who gave your life for us to give us life. And God, I pray that this morning you would own this room and all the other rooms where you are being listened to this morning. I pray that you would speak clearly. I pray that what you have said about this book would be true today, that its words will not return void. I pray that today, God, as we lean into, I think, what is a sobering and an alarming reality of some of the generational trends we are seeing, that we'll also see that this is not the first time, it's not a unique situation from history, that there are warnings to us, there is also encouragement to us found in the pages of the scriptures. So may I pray, God, your word leap off of this page as you speak it and breathe it into this room and into all the places listening, that we would hear it, we would be motivated by it, we would be challenged and changed, and that it would not return void in its impact, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, before I dive in, really quickly, I want to take up our offering this morning. And as always, just a super thank you and an appreciation to all of you who are part of helping Kensington do all we do. Uh, Prime example is this week, we've got Spring Hill, as Ryan mentioned, going to be right here on the grounds. We have hundreds of our students, hundreds of kids that are going to have a time. It's fun. It's going to be exciting. But the purpose is bigger than that. It's not just to give them a rock climbing wall. It is to give them Jesus. And so things like that, moments like that, literally can't happen without you. So I want to say, number one, thank you. Number two, if you're not a part of this, I just want to invite you into it and let you know that there's a lot of ways that you can partner up with us financially to do all that we're doing locally and nationally and globally. So on your screens are all those different efforts. And just again, say thank you for all that you do. There's no part of the kingdom impact that God uses this place to have that is not the direct result of your generosity and giving. So There's all the ways you can join with us. All right, here's what I want to do. 
I want to just uh, have all the generations in the room and watching online rep for a minute. So we did this in first service, lots of energy, lots of excitement. So don't let first service beat you. If you love your generation, be proud about it when I call you out in a minute. So here's what we're going to do. If you're in the room, just shout it out, do whatever you want to say, hey, I love what I'm a part of. If you're online, throw us a thumbs up in the chat. Let us know what generation you sit in. So here we go. We're going to go all the way back as far as necessary today. 1928 to 1945 is the silent generation. There you go. All right, not so silent. We love it. All right, here we go. 1946 to 1964, the boomers. Making some noise. All right. Next is the absolute, of course, best generation, 1965, 1980, the Xers. Woo! There's my people. All right, then we've got 1981 to 1996 would be the millennials or Gen Y. <laughs> then there's 1997 to 2012, Gen Z. All right, all right, I hear you over here, noisy section, got you. And then uh, Generation A, who is probably mostly back in K-Kids right now, is 2012 to 2025, but if you're in a room, make some noise. Wow, you're repping for an entire generation. Good for you. So there is a book in the Bible called Judges, and we're gonna jump right in. Like I said, a lot of work to do, short amount of time to get it done. Judges finds itself in the Old Testament early on in the pages of the Old Testament. So this is the earlier days of the nation of Israel being established, that nation being the nation that would eventually produce Jesus. He would be born through these people, through this lineage. In its earliest days, the nation of Israel finds themselves being led out of captivity by Moses. Let my people go, parting of the Red Sea, that Moses. Moses gets old at one point, hands the reins off to a man named Joshua. Joshua was kind of Moses' sidekick. It was his servant. It was a guy that Moses was discipling himself into, even though that wouldn't have been the word he would have used. There was intentionality. There was purpose. He was modeling his relationship with God to Joshua. He was talking about it. There were things he wrote down for him. There were instructions he gave them, and eventually he handed the baton off. So the Joshua then led the tribe. He led the nation. But we find ourselves in the book of Genesis in an interesting time, not too far into the future after Joshua has been leading. And it's a time where God raises up 12 different men and women to begin to call the nation back into relationship with himself because much like you and I, the nation of Israel had a tendency to consistently forget where life is found, what life is about, who life is about. And so they had this tendency to go in this on again, off again relationship with God. And they find themselves in the season of time where Judges is written, where they're in this long extended season of wandering away from God, beginning to take on the attributes, the values, the morality of the nations around them, beginning to worship the lesser than non-gods called the Baals around them as well, turning away from following the God that they knew previously had led them out of captivity, had been personal to them, had been the provider for them. And so there's this moment that in his goodness, but also in his sternness, God sends in the judges to call his people back into relationship with him. There's a verse in chapter 17, although where we're going to mostly camp is in chapter 2. Uh, verse 17 says this, verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 6. Kind of this is, this is the state of the nation at this time. In those days, Israel had no king. R read it out loud for me, would you? Just finish it. Everyone did as they saw fit. Other versions say everyone did as they saw right in their own eyes. And so what began to happen is instead of following after the Lord who had led them out of captivity, instead of continuing to ascribe to what he says, this is what makes life meaningful, purposeful, rich, and deep, is they all began to go, nah, I think we can figure that out ourselves. And so everybody begins to establish their own sense of justice, right, wrong, morality, what's up and what's down, what's valuable and what's not valuable. And as a result, as the nation begins to do this and they begin to live in a way as everybody just does whatever's right in their own eyes, everything goes upside down, everything spins out of control, morally, socially, sexually, economically, everything begins to go sideways. And so this is where God sends in the judges and say, no, 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 no. Essentially, he's trying to woo them back into relationship with him. 
saying, here's where life is found. The problem is, this isn't always what Israel's reputation had been. I mean, it's one thing if, if it's just, well, they're par for the course. They've always been this way. But there was a moment that this was not the case. As a matter of fact, Joshua 24, we're not going to read it, but I would encourage you to go back and read it at some point, is a passage where you have this significant moment early in the leadership of Joshua where he goes to the people of Israel and he kind of puts a stake in the ground. And as he begins to step in behind Moses, he says to them, listen, here's who we're going to be. We're going to be a people that run after God. And he has this famous moment. Some of you have this plaque in your house. Some of you have this on a coffee mug. It's the famous moment where he says to the people of Israel, I don't know about you, but as for me and my household, we will follow the Lord. And so the entire nation responds back to him in agreement. And they all say to him, we're going to do the same. Far be it from us, they say, to wander off from the God that has led us and protected us all these years. And so you have this significant moment of the entire nation beginning with its leader saying, we will be a people of God. As for us, we will follow the Lord. And what begins to unfold is a season of time of just prosperity and beauty and life and joy. And very quickly, that all begins to fade away. Because that's chapter 24, and if your Bible is organized like mine, chapter 24 of the book of Joshua and chapter 2 of the book of Judges is separated by one page. And in that one page, everything has changed about the nation. Because the nation has now begun to live where everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And as a result, every time they slip into this pattern of doing what they see right and wandering away from God, the same thing happens. The economy begins to tank, social upheaval, depression, wars, violence, everything goes to pot. It's probably hard to imagine what that would be like because it's nothing that we could compare to our daily lives, right? And so God sends in these judges to woo his people back to them. One of the things that you've got to ask, I think, just even in a very cursory overview of this point in the history of Israel from prosperity to absolute brokenness and an upside down everything about their lives and their world is is not just how did it happen, because I want to look at that, but if it happened, could it happen again? And not just could it happen again, but more poignantly, here's my question today, is it possibly happening again? You might go, well, probably the way it happens is just small little decisions to compromise and go a different direction over a long amount of time. And I would say decisions to go a different direction, yes. Large amount of time, no. So Judges chapter 2, verse 6. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went up to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him who had all seen the great things that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. So again, this is, this is an overview. I mean, we've got one page that separates him saying, here's who we're going to be, and now the life has gone by, his lifetime, his leadership, and he's passed on. And it says, and so they buried him in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Verse 10, this is key. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors... Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. There's cause and effect. A generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor the things that he had done for Israel. Then, that's the cause, here's the effect. Then they wandered off and they began to serve the Baals. This is when everybody began to interpret life the meaning of it, the value of it, the morality of it, through the lenses of their own eyes. When you take God out of the center, everything collapses. When you take him out of the center of the family, when you take him out of the center of your life, when you take him out of the center of the church, when you take him out of the center of everything, when you take God out of the center, everything collapses. And the quickest way to expedite that is to blur him or remove him altogether for the generations coming up behind you. And the ability to do that is soberingly more simple than you may suspect. All we have to do is what they did, is neglect to pass down the knowledge of who he is, the example lived out in our lives, 
and the stories of the great things he has done, not just in a general sense, but also in your life. This would be what I would say is the essence of the word we use in the church world of discipleship. Intentional, thoughtful, assertive investment into the lives of other people where both benefit from one another, but where there is just a natural passing on of what one person has journeyed down the road of ahead of the other. And when you do that in the context of living for Jesus, you are passing on Jesus to other people around you, whether that's other people of the same generation or previous generations or even older generations than you. But this is a particular story of a time when the generations ahead forgot to pass down the stories to the generations coming up behind them, and everything began to be lost and spiral out of control as a result of it. Before I introduce you to the Gen Zer who's going to take the stage in a minute, I want to introduce you to a family member. This is my, on the screen, this is my great, great, great grandfather Bevins. Grandpa Bevins... Um, my grandmother, a number of years before she passed away, I was at her house visiting, catching up, just kind of one of my regular trips with her. What she did not know at the time is I was in a particular season where most of the men in my life, I wouldn't say, maybe I should say many of the men that I had deeply looked up to, that had been the kind of men that had been discipling me, mentoring me along the way, were just chucking everything to the wayside. Their families, their walk with God, their values were just throwing it all. So I was in a kind of a depressed place at this time. Like this visit, my grandma didn't know. I was just coming to hang out with her. But in the back of my head, heavy on my heart, was just this question, are there any men that I've been following that are actually staying true? True to the Lord, true to themselves and who God has made them to be, true to their families. And so we're having this conversation. Grandma's completely unaware of all this that's going on in my life and in my own heart. And, and as always, she starts rolling through. Every time I was with her, she'd tell me different aspects of our family history and relatives I didn't know about. And, and along the way, she brings up Grandpa Bevins. Really short, really brief. Yeah, and you know, Grandma, he was great, great, great. And he was a sheriff down south. Uh, so anyways, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I have like a great, 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 great grandpa that was a sheriff down south. Tell me more. So she starts to tell me the story. So crazy story. This is like, this is like literally movie stuff from the West, old West. So he was a sheriff in a super small town. And one day, apparently some guy from out of town comes riding in, like this is movie style, breaks into the bank, shotgun in hand, robs the bank. Everybody's fleeing. Nobody knows what to do. So grandpa, who's the sheriff, runs in where everybody else is running out, confronts the guy, takes a belly full of buckshot, chases him down anyways, and grabs the guy. I think it was even on horseback, if I get the story correct, brings him back to the town, drags him in, and puts him in the jail cell. And I remember hearing that. I'm thinking, like, there are men in my lineage worth following, even if all the ones I know now are crumbling. And it just became this enormous moment of, Pride and, and even the ability to look to somebody that I didn't know personally, but I knew I could be, feel proud of and go, there, there's a man that stuck to his morals, that stuck to his courage, that didn't run when he had the chance to run. Sad part of the story, days later, he ended up passing away from his injuries. Town was, I don't even know if I just tell this part of the story, but it's just, it's movie-like. Town was so livid because they loved him so much, they broke into the jail, took him out into the city streets and executed town mob Justice, And I'm like, Grandpa Bevins. Here, here's the thing. I only learned that story a couple years ago. My whole life, I'd never known that story. When you stop telling the stories of the past, you lose the people. And when you lose the people, you lose their impact. Here's my question. Is it possible that right now there is a generation of people being neglected a story? being neglected something that is intended to be handed down by the generations ahead? Is it possible that even our own country's sense of losing itself and being upside down and ripping itself apart at the seams, is it possible that that is the cause and effect relationship between this story being lost of this generation? Between possibly today us making the same mistake that Israel made so many generations ago to fail to pass down the knowledge of the Lord and the things he has done. To step into intentional, realistic discipleship relationships with those around us, including the generations coming up behind us. 
Not in a way that we are the ones that have everything to teach. I'm telling you, you'll be taught, you'll learn. You jump into a relationship like that, I don't care if there's 20 years, 30 years, 40 years gap, you're both gonna learn and benefit. But there is a responsibility and a banner laid on all of us to hand down what God has done for us, taught us, led us into with experiences to those coming up behind us. And I actually think that there is a failure of that happening right now, similar to what we read about in the book of Judges. I'm gonna give you some statistics for the next couple minutes, and I know some of you love statistics, some of you don't. I'm gonna actually put all these on Facebook later today. So somebody asked me where they can get a copy of all this. I'm gonna post them later, because I'm gonna roll through them quickly. Let me also say this. If you have young kids in the room, uh, most of these are gonna be fine to listen to. There are a few as we get into some of the statistics of our younger generations and things that are plaguing them that are... They're, I mean, it's tough. There are gonna be some hard things that we'll have to talk about, about abuse and effect, and I just wanna share a few statistics. We're not gonna sit heavy in any of that, but there may be some of you that want the choice before I get there to say, hey, I'm gonna take my kid out into the hall. Nothing inappropriate, but there is gonna be some frank things I wanna share right now. Because there is a trend taking place. I'm gonna look at generic trends across the board of church, and then I'm gonna break it down to some of our younger generations. There are trends that we cannot ignore right now. For example... At this present moment, there's a decline taking place in the church that we have never seen before, to the tune of about 12 million people a year leaving the church. And many of them not just leaving some organized gathering, but leaving their faith, even many of them leaving altogether what they believe to be true about who God is and true about Jesus. Right now, a lot of people that study church trends and, and statisticians are saying that we have reached a point of decline that is irreversible in the United States. In the year 2000, 70% of people said that they belonged to a church. Today, that number is 47%. It's the first time ever in our history that that number has dropped below 50%. George Barna, who's a research group, does a lot of work with uh, churches and religious organizations, is also tracked some trends to show that there's not just a generic decline, there's actually a decline notable by generation. So for example, uh, the boomer generation, about 32% of you right now attend church on a weekly basis. Gen Xers, 29%. Millennials, 25 And Gen Z, there are numbers, for, here's what's interesting, there are numbers for Gen Z that, are, are, that kind of mirror the millennial statistics, but half of Gen Z right now, if their parents go to church, they're going to church because the age range is uh, 10 to 25 and so that number is still being solidified. We don't know exactly what that number is going to look like, but it is projected to be significantly lower than even the millennial mark of decline in leaving the church. And we know that particularly because right now, the church is losing a million young people every single year. The highest group of people right now among generations that identify as the nuns, not like Catholic nun, but like N-O-N-E-S, so no affiliation, no belief, no church attendance, the highest demographic is Generation Z. Which means not only are they on track to be the largest generation on the planet in human history, if the trend of leaving continues, they will be the largest generation to ever walk away from the church. Listen to me, something's gotta change. If, if you, I know we're all in different places and I won't assume that we're all listening online or in this room going, I'm an avid follower of Jesus Christ. I believe there's a God, I believe Jesus is him. I have met him, it's my desire to live my life for him. We're all in process. Some of you are trying to figure that out right now. Continue to come, we love you being here. This place was made for you, but let me address a few of you in the room online that you're, you're on the other place. You're going, hey man, I've been there, but I'm journeying and then over the course of my journey, I am following Jesus and I am committed to him and I'm committed to living this out. I'm committed to this being more than just a religious social club, then please hear me. We must wake up and do something different because there is an entire generation of our young people being fought over right now and they are falling as victims on the battlefield. It is time that we wake up and realize this cannot just go on like we have been doing. Something really has to change. And in its change, we must be a voice that says to hell, Hollywood, despair, anger, division, our own schedules of busyness and work, not on our watch. This is a generation we're dedicating back to Jesus. 
But that doesn't happen unless we're serious about this being more than just a social club. It doesn't happen unless we learn from the mistakes of the past with Israel. So I do want to share some statistics pertinent to our younger generations. But let me be clear, too, before I do. I am not trying to just rail on you by any means. This is not me going, I want to point out all the bad things. Listen to me. You are a generation, although all of us have things to praise about our different generations and things we uniquely bring to creation, bring to this world. You are a generation that has so much to bring to this world. And how everything has changed, there is just a reflection of that in you that is powerful. You are a generation that has a heartbeat that is so big, I think in large part because you are more connected in a global way than any of the rest of us have ever been as we grew up that you care at a level that I don't know that many of the rest of us do. Like when your heart breaks, it doesn't just break for a corner. It doesn't just break for a city. Like when your heart breaks, it breaks for a, it breaks for a nation. It breaks for a globe. Like when you want to see change, you don't want to just see change in your neighborhood. You want to see change on the planet. Like there's a way that you approach relationships that we could learn from as well. Like, you don't want the fake and the phony and the I'm going to just give you the nice, pretty smile. Like, there's something about you that wants the genuine all of it, like the gritty and the good. Like, when we say we want authentic relationships, like, you're a generation that really gets that. Like, you live that out in a very different way. You're a generation that's not content to put up with much of the selfishness and the corruption that previous generations have normalized. You're a generation also committed in many ways to call out the sins of the previous generation and work to undo them. Like you're an amazing generation of people. But I do think that there is an undeniable war for your heart, for your soul, and for your mind being dedicated to Jesus. Let me give you just a couple of sobering realities here. In the next 24 hours, approximately 3,000 teenagers are gonna attempt suicide. In 24 hours. 53% of Generation Z say that they often feel sad and anxious most of the time. Most of Generation Z say that they feel bored more often than they don't. Do you know, for Generation Z, you know what the attention span is? Anybody know? What would you guess? What? Two minutes? Eight seconds. Eight seconds. There's a way that the world has taught you how to see things and how to be entertained that is actually decreasing your ability in many ways to relate, to connect, to be engaged, which is why I think there's such an extreme boredom so often that you feel. It also means that in eight seconds, you're determining value, worth, truth. I'm, there's just no way that that's humanly possible to ascribe the time of work necessary to figure out what is true and what is not, what's valuable and what is not in eight seconds time. In the next 24 hours, nearly 3,000 teenage girls will become pregnant. Homicide rates for 18 to 24 year olds has increased 65% in the last number of years. For 14 to 17 year olds, it has increased 165%. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 24-year-olds. It is the sixth leading cause of death for 5 to 14-year-olds. One in two rape victims is under 18. One in six is under 12. Every year, students spend $5.5 billion on alcohol, which, listen to me, is more than juice, milk, pop, and books combined. 50% of teens admit to regularly sexting. And then I don't know if you've got kids in high school or junior high right now, but the bullying epidemic that we have seen before kind of maybe go down a little bit is gone through the roof. People are so triggered, so angry, so upset, so divided, being told who's in and who's out so much. Even my own school system that my kids are a part of, they just finished ninth grade. This last year, about midway through the year, we were told that the, the suspension rate had gone up 200% from years prior to COVID just midway through the year already. And many of you know that. Many of your kids have come home and experienced it. Like there is a plague coming against our kids right now. And, and you may not agree with me that the answer is Jesus, but I think we can all agree there is a problem and what we are doing is not working. 
something has to change. I believe what has to change, though, is Jesus. And I think part of what maybe we need to face is the reality that we're making some of the mistakes that Israel once made. How does an entire generation grow up and not know the Lord other than the generation prior stopped passing on the knowledge, the experience, the stories, stopped living it out? Listen, if there's a couple things that we need to give attention to in our lives, and I wanna, I wanna lean more into these throughout the series, but number one is we have to be people that are committed to actually live this out. You're gonna hear from a Gen Zer in just a couple of minutes that one of the things that drives them nuts and that has driven them, many of them, away from the church is seeing so many of us that ascribe a life to Jesus and it doesn't look anything like it. Before we start looking at the generations behind us to say, I wanna come alongside you, let's look in the mirror and ask, is the fruit of Christ actually in our lives? Are we living out what we say we believe? Because they're gonna see it in our life long before they listen to it in our words. We've got to be people committed to actually live this out. Like, are we living this out? Do they see it in our temper? Do they see it in our values? Do they see it in how we treat our spouse? Do they see it in in just us? Do they see it? Or is there an absence of it other than maybe the occasional going to church? But I think not only living it out, man, we've got to write it down. You can't pass on what you forget, and we forget a lot. Life is busy, and life is full. Like, we've we've tried to create different ways in our family over time to just write down the stories of what God has done in our life and make sure our kids are getting it. My wife did something a couple years ago at Christmas where she asked her parents, after we did the whole gift thing, to just take a few minutes and share their story of coming to faith because her parents were the first one in eons in her family to walk with Jesus. And so she wanted the grandkids to all know, like, like you're the product of decisions your grandma and grandpa made years ago to follow the Lord. And so they sat there and for about 45 minutes just shared their story. Like, are, are we writing things down? Are we capturing the stories? Are we sharing them? with our kids, with other people, with, their, with your nieces, with your nephews. You're, I don't have any. I'm, a, I'm an empty nester. We've got a student ministries that would love to have you involved. We've got K-kids that would love to have you involved. There is no shortage of opportunity we can provide if you've got no young people in your life for them to be in your life, for you to be a blessing to them and them equally to become a blessing to you. But we, I mean, we've got to live it. We've got to share it regularly. We've got to write it down to pass on the stories. But I think we've also got to start by listening. Like we have to have an ear that says this will be open more than this. And not not listening so that we can then tell you what we think, but listening so that we can understand. Listening so that we can see what can we actually absorb from younger generations, from other generations. But listening so that we have greater discernment to know how would God have me to give my life away in these relationships. So I want to bring out, like I said, one of my favorite Gen Zers for the next couple minutes and have him sit here and talk through some of this with me. So this is my son, Tobin. So if you would just, yeah, go go ahead. Three of you are glad. What up? I don't need applause. What? I said I don't need applause. You don't need applause. All right, let's do this. All right, so I asked Tobin to come up here and just share life and church and faith from his perspective and just kind of let you guys sit in on a little bit of a conversation between the two of us from now. I feel like we're like so far apart. We actually like each other, right? So, so let, let's do this. So just give us a really quick bio, like who you are and age and all right. What do you love um, most about life? Like what's your, what do I love passion? most about life? Uh, I love, well, that's a good question actually to start. Uh, what I love most about life is the exploration of it. Um, not just where I can go, what I can see, but what I can discover within myself, what I can discover about people, about what I know about humanity and human history. I love history. History is amazing to me. But just the idea of human nature is so interesting to me, and that's something that I really love to mess with and conceptualize and play with and philosophize about. And just that's, that's, that's a big part of me. But besides that, the generic, you know, mountain biking, snowboarding, I play guitar, all of that, that's... Who, that's, ta- who taught you to do all that? <laughs> I don't know. You know what, and you know what? For real? And you're better than me at all of it, too, which is awesome. I knew the day would come. Can't He's lie, here. bro. So, uh, age, you're how old? 19. You're 19, and you have the coolest birthday in the world. It is? 
Three, three, three. So, um, so here's what I'd love. Like, I think every generation sees the world a little differently based on when you were born and what was happening around you, whether it was in a time of, of abundance or a time of depression or there's just a time of war. There's, there's a different way that different generations see the world. There's lenses. So kind of generically, you're, I'm going to ask you to speak for your whole generation, and obviously everybody can't be spoken for in one person. But right. How do you think your generation looks at the world compared to maybe how other generations do? I know from my own personal experience and a lot of conversations, we see the world like you were saying in first service. You know, we like to identify and exemplify the beauty and understand it, mm -hmm. right? So where things come from, we like to understand the beauty behind the structure of things, but also the beauty behind the organic nature mm -hmm. of the natural world to what that looks like and how we exist in that. Um, there's, there's also a part of us, too, that we view the world as everyone's done everything wrong except us, a lot of times. <laughs> and it's true. There's an extreme cynicism against past generations. Wait, it's true that that's how you view the world, or it's true that we have? It's true that that's how we view the world. Got it. But that's not true in itself at all. Um, we are growing up in a time of comfort, and I heard it from a podcast the other day I was listening to, and it's, it's, a, it's a concept historians use all the time, but it's the idea that civilizations will walk up the steps of civilization in wooden shoes and they'll descend it in silk slippers. Hmm. And so as a civilization descends, they find this trend where as things get more comfortable, you wear the silk slippers, you start to fall down the ladder of civilization, and inevitably, like Greece or Rome, it collapses. Hmm. And so we have grown up, realistically and obviously, in a generation that is the silk slippers generation. Now, whether we're going up and down is argued, but we are, the, we are a silk slipper generation. Right. And, and part of what you're saying, too, I think is important. This has been important for your mom and I to understand about you and about your generation is it, in, whether it's the up or the down, part of what you're looking for in life, because things have been kind of the silk slippers, if you will, mm -hmm. is that the, the blessings of life, the abundance of life almost becomes normalized. And so you're looking for beauty. So where you look for beauty is very different than even generations before. You're not looking for it in the, the, the car, the house. You know, you're looking for it in the world around you, mm -hmm. which is something that I think we're learning about your generation is that you, the way you see the world is you look for beauty and you actually see the beauty in the world around you. Like, like when I started to realize this about him, this is when I realized that's why it takes you four hours to cut the lawn and it takes me an hour. I'm like, what is that boy doing out there? Oh is he cutting gosh. the grass? Or, and I'm like, what is he doing? And, and so I, what I realized is there were times you'd come in and you're like, you're like, Dad, I'm, I'm done with the lawn. I'm like, I know, it's four years later. What happened? And you're like, but look at this amazing sunset I got. And like, you're literally out there, like you're taking photos where I would just be cutting the lawn and you're seeing the beauty that I'm overlooking. Because I think part of my generation, at least for me, is I see the task at hand. I see the things we can accomplish and we can conquer, the mountains we can climb. And you're going, hey, why do I climb it? Let's just take in the beauty. And so there's times where I've ascribed to you a laziness that isn't lazy. It's actually that you are modeling to me how to slow down right. and see the beauty that's really around us everywhere every day. I think that's a gift in my generation. It's a, it's a double-edged sword on certain days, too, because there is a level of that that grows into whatever people would call laziness, you mm -hmm. know? It, it's, we've grown up in this comfortable society, so we don't necessarily, most of us, don't have to worry about where our first car is coming from or things mm -hmm. like that, right? So the idea that I have to work hard to get certain things isn't as prevalent as I've seen in past generations. Mm -hmm. In my generation, it's very privilege. Hmm. It's a lot of things are handed to us. And I personally have had to work hard to kind of pull that apart and destroy that in myself and say, there's a level of working hard, but there's also a level of observation that I need to have to understand that the creation that God gave us is a gift. Hmm. And I want to exist in that gift and understand what that means to live life with God, but also to live on a planet where realistically I have to work hard hmm. to fend for myself, my family, my community. So I'm going to throw one at you that wasn't one of the questions that we talked about ahead of time. What, what, is it you, what would you most want 
other generations to know about your generation? What I would most want other generations to know my, about my generation, uh, and I actually, I have a statistic. Can I read it? Not a statistic, yeah. but it's like a little thing. So if, if I had to give one thing I wish that most people knew about my generation, it was that um, there's an issue with what we believe about Christianity as Gen Z. And I'm going to speak in generalities here, mm -hmm. but it's, it's the idea that most of Gen Z and what they believe, the ones that actually say they believe in a God, they don't believe in the Christian God, but it's a deity nonetheless. Mm -hmm. They call it moralistic therapeutic deism. It's this idea arising that they believe in something that has some morals, but they're completely subjective. It provides some sort of therapy, mm -hmm. but it's completely subjective. And it's some sort of overarching power that's bigger than us because we all want that to some extent. So it's literally doing right in our own eyes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this, is, um, th this is Albert Muller. One of their articles said, Indeed, our missiological challenge may be even greater than the confrontation with paganism. For we face a succession of generations who have transformed Christianity into something that bears no resemblance to the faith revealed in the Bible. The faith once, quote-unquote, delivered to the saints mm -hmm. is no longer even known, not only by American teenagers, but by most of their parents as well. Millions of Americans believe they are Christians simply because they have some historic tie mm -hmm. to a Christian denomination or identity. We now face the challenge of evangelizing to a nation that largely considers itself Christian, overwhelmingly believes in some sort of deity, considers itself fervently religious, but has virtually no connection to true historic Christianity. This is what you're reading in your free time? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Same. Yeah, that's awesome, man. But and I think part of that is just what I see in your generation is a desire to, to just pull it all out in the front. Like you, that's part of what I was even saying about the authenticity. Like you really don't want partial reality. You don't want to just deal with some of what is the reality. Like, just pull it all out. Let's deal with it, even the ugliness of what is, the beauty of what is. Let's have an authentic view and connection to everything, including people and just the state of existence right now. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious with you, though, what, like with you, so your generation, my generation, Xers, and we got boomers, and we got millennials. What do you think your generation could learn from other generations? Let me pull this out. I wrote some stuff down, too, because I didn't want to forget it. So what I think that you, what you said, you, what you think we could learn from you or what you yeah. could learn from us? What yeah. we could learn from you? What you guys could learn from other generations. I'm going to flip it then and ask the opposite okay. too. But. So what I think we could learn from you, um, and this is something that if you are mentoring a young person, this is massive. And I've seen it play out in my own life and I've seen the impact it's had on me watching this as an example, but also being taught this, you know, verbally with conversations. Mm -hmm. Patience is huge. The eight-second time span for attention is a legitimate thing. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, why do you think we have such a huge culture of people with ADHD, or whatever they like to call it? Some mm -hmm. sort of attention deficiency disorder, and it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Eight-second time span for attention is huge. We need to learn patience, and the idea that in older generations that you could truly have this idea that, okay, well, for example, I'm going to invest in a farm or property or land or whatever you want to do, right, or a business. You'd own the family business and you'd build it up to pass it on and then you'd build it up to pass it on. And that's how it was for millennia. That's how it was all throughout history, mm -hmm. right? And we have started to move away from that. Hmm. It's no longer this patient idea. It's, I might be here for a couple years at this job, but then I'll get unsatisfied and I'll move on. It's not the long run. It's about what makes you happy currently in the moment, and that's not what we should be striving for. I remember hearing a uh, quote a couple years ago that the new radical is consistency. Mm -hmm. Instead of like, you know, previous generations, maybe radicals, we're going to do something new, and that now the new radical is actually just staying consistent. Though that's, that's true for my generation. That's incredibly true. Mm -hmm. There's a lack of consistency. And stability was the other one I was going to say, so that's, mm -hmm. that's, that goes right along. Stability scripturally or in what we believe about anything. Hmm. The amount of cultural movements that have popped up in the past four years even, where, let's be realistic about it, most of us jump from one to the other like that, hmm. all over the place. One day it's this, the next day it's this, the next day it's this, until the first one that was four months ago was completely forgotten. You don't even remember hmm. it. 
there is such a lack of stability, we jump to whatever's put right in front of our eyes. Whether it's an article about evolutionary principle mm -hmm. and the idea that that makes more sense, and so we ascribe to that for a time being. Yeah. Or maybe they find something new out about um, scriptural texts that were found, and that's what we ascribe to for the time being. Mm. Where is the foundation where we add on yeah, instead of destroy change. and take and, and right. rebuild and destroy and rebuild and destroy and rebuild? If you keep doing that, your foundation just crumbles entirely. It's good, dude. It's good. So we got to bring it to a close here. Let me let me ask you this. Um, reverse question, quickly. Mm -hmm. What can what can you and your generation do you think teach the rest of us? One thing that I think, and this is a desire that we all really have, is, um, and we see this, this is why a lot of people have left the church from my generation. Mm. This is why I've had issues with a lot of church, uh, church templates, the way people have done things, is honesty. Mm. We don't want to run away from the issue, but we want it identified so we can approach it. Mm. If it's not identified for us, and it feels like it's danced around, we don't want it. Hmm. We'd rather have the honesty in the fault than have the deceit and the lie telling hmm. us that something is better than it really is. Hmm. If something is blatantly and obviously wrong, just say it's wrong, because hmm. we want to help with it. Clearly, we want to be a part of all these big movements. Hmm. The biggest movement, the most impactful movement, is the one that saves your soul, and yet, we don't want it danced around. We just want it up front. Mm. We want the honesty with, this is what's wrong. This is what we want to do better. Help us do it better. Mm. Even though you're young, help us do it better. Learn with us. Grow with us. Change with us. We want the upfront honesty about it. That's it. It's good. It's good. Again, it goes, yeah, this goes to the authenticity. I think you've definitely seen your generation, and I see it in you, is just not drawn to the big, the produced, the flashy, the fake, the plastic, is that that's just, it repels you. What you want is all of it, the grit and the glory, because that's real. And I think, uh, yeah, I think there's a way that even your mom and I probably missed that. Even in your involvement in church, I think even at times we've tried to almost shield you from some of just the the ugliness of church because we're broken and we make broken mistakes. And I just know even as you shared earlier that you know, one of the mistakes we made was you know, the season of time when you had some of your greatest hurt as a kid at church watching people behave poorly is that we never talked about it. We never brought you into that. We never explained it. We never just had the moment of like, yeah, this is a beautiful community, but we're also broken people. And I think I was trying so hard to only let you see the good of church so that you wouldn't walk away from it. And what I actually almost risked doing was driving you away from it because I only showed you part of it instead of all of it. So, yeah. This, um, this coming Wednesday, we're doing midweek, and Ryan, if you were in here when he talked about it, it's, it's gonna be a different kind of midweek for us where we're gonna sit on stage with Nicole, my wife's gonna be up here, and Sam and Amber, and uh, Jeremiah and his wife from the Clarkston campus, and we're just gonna have a conversation about these kind of topics, these kind of moments, being a family together. And Tobin's gonna join us, and Jeremiah's son is gonna join him, and uh, we're working on getting somebody else here with us on stage as well, representing Gen Z. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper. We're gonna, I'm gonna throw some questions out to Tobin, and I have no idea how he'll answer them, but I'm gonna have him share even openly, like how, how have we screwed up as parents? Where have we dropped the ball? Where, where have we not dropped the ball? But just have a really honest moment. We just figure if this is gonna to continue to be beneficial, then it's gotta, be, it's gotta be honest as well. So thanks for being here today, bud. We love you tons. Super proud of you. Love you, Dad. So, all right, man. We're gonna take, uh, we'll take one last minute. We're gonna bring it to a close with one more song. And as we do, just let the words of this just sit with you about the greatness that is God and our willingness to sing forever and pass that story and that message on. Oh, yeah.
pray for us. Father, I ask that you would ignite something within us, that we would be learners of history, the stories that you have been so good to make sure have been cradled in the scriptures and handed down to us. And sometimes those stories are encouraged. Sometimes the accounts of what happened are to inspire. Sometimes they're to correct. Sometimes they're to warn. There's a story of what your people once failed to do that I think we find ourselves at a unique time in human history right now where it necessitates that we pay attention and we learn and we heed their warning lest we be another generation that fails to pass you on. And so God, I pray that you would ignite something that extends far beyond this morning, way beyond my words, beyond Tobin's words, but the Holy Spirit, you would speak into the deepest places of who we are. That we would be a people so committed to you, so lived out in our daily lives, that it will be said instead in the years to come, these were generations that passed on Jesus Christ. We pray this and ask this, give us strength, knowledge, and wisdom to know how. Continue to draw us to you and do something, I pray, God, that only you can to create a church that is a community of locked arms generations for the sake of the gospel and the kingdom of Jesus. Amen. There's a team of people here that love you enough that they're going to hang out afterwards to pray for you. So if we can serve you in that way, uh, they're going to be down front. There's also a table in the lobby if you want to stop by. Please let us do that. Don't forget midweek coming up this week. Have a great rest of the day. We'll see you next Sunday as we continue on in the series.